Good morning. I'm so used to saying that. Good evening. Welcome to Victory Baptist Church. Why don't you stand as we sing. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. And I know by thy good pleasure, safely I'll arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Let's open our time together with prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, we, uh, we praise you for your goodness to us uh, this week thus far throughout our lives in the day today. We thank you so much for this time uh, that we get to have together midweek, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Um, we thank you that uh, we have this opportunity to have open doors uh, and, uh, and uh, so that we can get into your word and, and grow closer to you. Um, and uh, we ask that you would bless this time, help us to, uh, to listen closely to your spirit and to, uh, to your word this evening, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. All right. Good evening. I hope everyone's doing well. And how many of you are, are not enjoying this heat? It's too hot. You're just dying. Okay, a few of you. All right, listen, don't worry. January will be here before you know it. Amen. And you'll be freezing and complaining about minus 40, and you'll be colder than cold. So don't you worry about that at all. It's This is Manitoba. Don't worry. It's coming. Amen. Unless Jesus comes back. And so we're for that, for sure. Okay, um, just basic announcements are uh, Sunday school at 9.30, church service at 10.30 on Sunday mornings. Please make sure you look at the announcements. That way we can keep them to a verbal minimal. Uh, if you just catch them on, on the wall, they're uh, before church, between services, and after. They'll be rotating the announcements so you can keep up to speed with all those kind of important pertinent type of information that we need to know as a church family. Uh, at this time, Brother Sam is going to come and uh, share a letter, and then I'm going to ask you for testimonies. We'll get a couple folks with microphones, two microphones, get ready, and then we will uh, go from there. Here, this won't be too much new for you, but just to remember, and this will be up on the board, uh, there's two pages, so if you want to read it, you sort of have to pull the first one out so you can see the second one. 
So um, as he says, he was away for seven weeks visiting supporting churches and some new churches. And um, he has four ministries. The one is the North Country Baptist Children's Home. That's his main uh, emphasis. Uh, and they have a number of young people graduating from high school in November. Um, they, uh, and, and he said that it's hard for them because they didn't come until they were 8 and 11. So they've had to catch up with their school. Um, and um, the Crows are going over to Cambodia in, in October in time to see them graduate. It's been a while because of COVID that they have been over to Cambodia. So uh, pray for that. And, and they've taken another young boy in, and um, he got saved recently through uh, the Smoky Mountain ministry. Now, that's the next thing that he talks about, Smoky Mountain. Now, remember, can somebody tell me what's the significance of Smoky, Smoky Mountain? Uh, yes. It's a garbage dump, and so you got the methane and the and the steam and the, all the Smoky Mountain. And, and so that's why they call it Smoky Mountain, because it's a dump. And, and these people live on the dump. They, they scavenge on the dump. They, they get um, housing material from the dump. They get clothing from the dump besides food. So um, he, he has a pastor now that's also going on a Saturday program for the children. They, they give them fresh water, food, and then have time for games, Bible stories, and a gospel presentation. The first week, they had 100 children. The second week, we had 70 children, and 14 accepted Christ as their Savior. Amen. One of them is the boy that was mentioned up at the children's home. So that's two things. The third thing is there's a whole bunch of pastors and, and young Christians at the Vietnam border. And they have nobody, they used, there was a American pastor who was there, but he got ill and had to go back to the States. So they came to where, um, to Cambodia, to the, where the, the crows have their home and said, we need help. We need somebody who can teach us. And the crows just didn't have the time at that point. But these people kept coming back and they kept coming back and, and so, they've decided to to do some ministry with them and one of the men uh in, in the in the children's home uh is willing to go occasionally and now when pastor goes over he'll um, he'll be able to spend some time going and uh, i guess he has an interpreter uh, i don't think he knows uh vietnamese yet um but and and these people are not just in a central area they walk hours to come in uh, to, to meet in various places. So that's the third ministry. And then the fourth ministry is called the Floating Village. And uh, these are Vietnamese refugees who have f fleed from Vietnam, and they're on the, the river in, in, the, in the, the town in, in Cambodia, uh, but the Cambodians won't let them on land. Uh, they're... They're, they just can't come on land. They can stay on the boats, they can stay on the river, and they fish and they, they catch crocodiles and whatever they can to eat, but they don't get enough to eat. And, and there's very little um, ministry for them. So uh, one of this man has, has started a, a called Galilee Church on the Tonal Sap River. And, and uh, the people persecute them because they don't want them there, uh, but uh, as sometimes they'll cut the boat loose and it'll be found a couple miles down the, down the river. Um, but there's a picture here of people that come to the floating church and the food that's been provided. So it's not just a Christian ministry, it's a food provision, uh, clothing provision, um, just encouraging them, you know, because these are people that are, are out of place. And so uh, just pray for the crows and these four ministries that they have and as they go over in October uh, it's you could really tell that's where his heart was okay yeah he's been in Aurelia for a number of years he has a church that I believe he started or kept going uh, and and he cares about that but you could tell his heart was in Cambodia and um, so let's pray for them right now father uh, we th thank you for this man Len 
and his wife and the, um, the ministry that they have in Cambodia and help them to uh, be able to accomplish much in your name uh, through your power uh, as they go over and, and uh, administer and, and organize and try to keep this programs going. And thank you for the men over there that are willing to work with them, are willing to uh, give of their time and their efforts for these people in Cambodia in these four situations. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. It's an amazing ministry that they have. And uh, do you understand these boat people are now like three generations living and being born and living and dying on these boats, their whole lives on boats. They're never allowed to go. They have docks between boats, but they're never allowed to go onto the land. It's amazing. All right, so we're going to just give a few testimonies. Does anyone want to share? I don't want to belabor, but does anyone have something you just want to thank God for, give a praise for, and we'll start over here. We have two right here. Okay. <clears throat> Are we on? Yeah. So um, I've been having issues at home, and uh, anyway, I discovered that there was an issue with my air conditioning, okay. and I was really dreading it. But I called the company who had come out and done the uh, condenser line cleaning last week, and I called them. I said, I have this leak. I don't know what's going on. They said, no problem. We'll have someone out this afternoon. And he said, it'll be no charge. Nice. Are you serious? They spent an, uh, three guys, an hour and a half. They fixed it and no charge. Praise what God. What a blessing. Yes, for sure. That's awesome, especially today, right? Day like today, you, you most people need it. So, amen. A wonderful husband. God blessed me with him. And amen. God also gave me a, a real blessing when he made David be sick because that was a trust that God put in my heart, and it was a trust that I had to follow. So David is in a home now, and he doesn't remember an awful lot, but what really sparks him is when I go in in the afternoon and I read him the Bible. Amen. He remembers that, so it must be a very, very important thing in his life. And that is a blessing to me that because is. he's one that brought me to the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's a great story. <clears throat> and it's great to see Sheila. That's a blessing, Perry, just to see her be able to come into church. I mean, it's sad that Dave has to be in care. Dave's the only person I know in this city that speaks proper King's English. He's from Texas. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Texas. It's not Texas. It's Texas. So. Yes, sir. If I could put it into two words, I'm going to say Monday night. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yes. Praise God. The wedding was beautiful. Don and Joy are now hitched. They married and they called me from the road today and they're doing well. And he says, she can't keep her hands off me. <laughs> I, st I couldn't stop laughing. That's great. I praise the Lord, right? I guess that's the way it should be, right? Amen to that. So there you go. All right. That's right. She's trying to take the steering wheel. Let me drive. Let me drive. That's what she's probably, that's what he meant, I'm sure. I'm sure that's what he meant. So come on over here, Emil, this side. We're going to sit over here, okay? We're not going to sit in the empty sections. All right. So everyone, so yeah, so they're doing well. They're on the road and uh, they're heading west. So pray for safety. Pray the, you know, things will go well for them as they journey. It was, it was very good. It was a beautiful evening and a beautiful night and uh, everything went well. Pastor Dick did a good job and it was a blessing. So amen. All right. Anyone else or anything else? Yes, back there. Just want to praise the Lord. We uh, were moved into our new house. Amen. So praise we God. have all of our stuff in there and one night down already. So praise so the Lord. All Everything got moved in and nice. we're just a little sore. <laughs> yeah. Amen. That is, gr that is great to hear. Amen. Lord's blessing for sure. All right. Anyone on this side? Anyone else? I just want to keep moving tonight. Okay, yes, Samuel? Uh, I don't know how much to say, but uh, I'll just say the word Matthew, uh, who was here on Sunday. Yes. It was just one of those things where you don't know what to say and you don't know how much to believe, but when you see somebody and you talk to them and okay. then they say, I want to go to church tomorrow, and so you <laughs> believe them. Right. You know, and, yes. and he came. And, and that and, was a blessing. You know, and sometimes they, when you give them a track, they say, I want to find a church just to make you happy. But 
he didn't. He really wanted to come, and he really was glad. And um, yeah, and we were able to get him a ride down to 75 with the Kilfoyles. So, Amen. you know, uh, that he was on his way to Minneapolis. Praise the Lord. Hopefully he'll get saved. All right, anyone else on this side have a testimony? He, he would say he is. Oh, okay. All right, yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Anyone else have a testimony? Sean? Okay, over here on this side. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, I just wanted to praise the Lord for what he's doing uh, in our home. Amen. And for all of you, um, we've had so much support, and uh, I have a I have a friend that's uh, he's stepped up and offered to rewire our entire house for free. Amen. Uh, we had a neighbor that came out and they're fixing some things that uh, that need to be repaired before winter, and he's got a he's got a crew of people coming out and they're just doing it just to help us and um, we've had financial support and, and other support uh, from our family here and um, it's very humbling and I'm just grateful Amen. we sure do love you and your family and we are grateful for all of you even the new ones Amen. We're glad you're here. For sure. That is for sure. Looking forward to just walking with the Lord with you. There's no life like local New Testament church life. You can search the world over. You can travel. You can get excited. And you can do all your cool cuckoo stuff. But at the end of time, there's nothing like being plugged into a local New Testament church where God loves you and God's people love you. It's a great thing. There's no life like it. But God bless you, brother. We sure are grateful for you. We love you. And we thank the Lord for your family. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anyone else have a blessing or testimony tonight? Anyone else? Yes, right here. Benji, good to see you. I know you don't always make it. Amen. Hi, um, My English is not good. Oh, that's here. Yeah. Ah. Good. It's okay. Um, first, I thank God for saving my wife uh, last night. Amen. Because I'm living in uh, North End. Yes. And my neighbor is all gangster. Okay. Then my wife is nearly hit by their car. They run very fast. But she's okay. Yeah. Amen. That's I mean, I know it. that, I but it's God everyone else my wife. Praise God that he kept her safe. Amen. Yeah. And she's okay now, right? Yeah. Okay, good. You're doing okay? Yeah. Amen. Anything else? That's all. Okay, praise God. All right. Jerry, could you just introduce your visitor's name again, please, to us? Okay. There you go. Thank you, Wesley. There you go. Yeah, I was thinking of, of asking for the mic, too. Uh, my name's Anthony. I'm from uh, south of La Riviere, Manitoba, which is close to Manitou, close to Morton, close to Winkler. Okay. Um, or, <laughs> yeah, it is, it is very pretty. Anyway... Um, yeah, I just, this is my first time ever living in Winnipeg. And so I, I just, I just praise God for my nerves and driving and. It's going to be okay. <laughs> it's going to be yeah. okay. Trust so, me, it's going to be okay. Yeah. And going to school and just all the variables have been, yeah, it's been really good. I've seen God work in that. Amen. Praise and in, God. And in the people around me here. So. Yeah, Amen. It's good. I'm sorry, one more time. Tell us your first name for me. Uh, An An Anthony. Anthony. Okay, we have another Anthony. Okay, let's welcome Anthony tonight. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Good to have you here. We're always blessed to have visitors. We count it an honor and a privilege. All right, this time, Jerry, would you come and lead us in another song? And Haley, if you would, please. Well, we, we couldn't, we, we didn't plan this. There just wasn't time. Um, Sam was just talking about Smoky Mountain. We're going to sing Higher Ground. Would you stand as we do? I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm upward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. 
My heart has no desire to stay Where doubts arise and fears dismay Though some may dwell where these abound My prayer, my aim is higher ground Lord, lift me up and let me stand By faith on heaven's table land A higher plane than I have found Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Thank you for your singing. Please be seated. Thank you, Haley, for playing this evening. And uh, just take your Bibles, and uh, we're going to be turning to Mark chapter 3. But before we do, let's have a word of prayer. Mark chapter 3. We're going to look at three separate passages this evening. And, uh, but I'm going to do a little talking, and then we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll look at the Scripture, and we'll, we'll approach and broach the subject, if you will. We're going to go to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter number 3. All right. You know, I had my lesson all laid out two or three days ago, or it was done. It was basically done, okay? But then all of a sudden, I just felt it wasn't right. It wasn't the right one. It wasn't the one I was supposed to do tonight. So I felt compelled to go a different direction tonight. I felt that this is what the Lord wanted me to do instead. And that's very disturbing. It means you have to trust God. You can't just lean on what you've got. You've got to say, all right, Lord, if you're sure, that's fine. And it, you know what? And if it all goes wrong tonight, well, then blame me. Don't blame the Lord, okay? So I want to talk to you this evening about a very controversial subject within Christendom, Christianity. Not necessarily in our church, not necessarily in our type of churches, but in what we call Christianity in the big, giant, huge umbrella of Christianity. Many years ago when I was a brand spanking new Christian, I used to watch once in a while uh, television. There were only like three, four television channels back then. But on Sunday nights or, yeah, usually Sunday afternoon, Sunday nights, you could catch some of the uh, Christian preacher, TV preacher guys in the 70s, uh, from the 70s, actually the mid-80s is what it was. And they would talk about the Bible and truth and things like that. And uh, there was a lot of what we call charismatic preachers on television, Pentecostal, if you'll allow me, slash charismatic. I understand there's a difference between a Pentecostal and a charismatic. For all intents and purposes, I'm just kind of big picturing it here. They're very, very similar, though there are a few distinctions. Um, and the charismatic preachers would get on television, and they were charismatic. They were dynamic. Their delivery was out of this world. Some of them were just amazing. And, uh, but the problem is sometimes they would teach what's called false teachings and false doctrines. And they would get on television. Now, remember, I'm a brand new Christian when this happened. And this guy would get on and say, some of you are going to get wrapped up in heresy of eternal security. And the stadium was full of people, and they'd be cheering and clapping. And some of you, they always wiggle their voice like Elvis. Some of you, some of you are going to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And as a baby Christian, I got really scared. I didn't want to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. I didn't want that to happen to me. Remember, I was a brand new Christian. How old are you, Cale? How old? 15. Who's 18 in here? Any boys in here about 18? All right, I was about Rush's age, okay? I was, I was just maybe 19, 18, 19, right in there. And this guy kept talking about blaspheme the Holy Ghost, and I got really scared because if any idiot 
could do it, it was going to be me. I'm the guy to do that. And so he would talk about the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost and you'd be lost for, he couldn't just say lost, it was lost forever. And there are people, now remember I've been saved for 35, 30, I don't even know off the top of my head, 37 years by now, I don't know. And there are people, since then I've learned a few things, a couple verses since then. But there are people that hold to that blasphemy of the Holy Ghost that you're going to blaspheme the Holy Ghost and you're going to be lost forever. So a lot of not all, okay, not all, but a lot of people who would hold to charismatic Pentecostal apostolic succession of supernatural gifts such as tongues I know most of you in the room know, but here, let me teach you something about teaching. Never take it for granted that everybody in the room knows what you're talking about, okay? So you old crusty Christians, you just bear with me for the new saved people, all right? Tongues, Pastor Pittman, what does that mean? Tongues was something that happened in the book of Acts with the apostles and their direct converts. And uh, they would say, in these churches that tongues means you make strange utterances angelic eclectic sounds glossia they get all fancier and they say you just say shh you know like uh 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 and they make all these strange uh things and if you make fun of that you're blaspheming false healing How many understand we're a Baptist church? We believe in the healing, the physical healing that God can heal. Would you say amen if you believe God can still and will heal when he chooses? Say amen. Amen. All right, just checking. We believe God can do everything and anything, and he can and he does heal, even though some people uh, uh, think that on television these guys have the power to smack people and knock them down and they're charlatans and they take people's money and they say they have the supernatural power to heal like the apostles the apostles did it through God I don't want to get in all that but right now and then some will say they have a vision a vision they have supernatural visions that God told them you're going to give them a million dollars you know it's always a big con job with stuff side note speaking of tongues uh, a Baptist pre- two Baptist preachers and one of the uh, converts went to a, uh, a holiness tent meeting in the 70s. And this guy was a Greek. I mean, he was a full-fledged Greek. He could speak Greek as well as you and I speak English. And he stood up in this meeting. They're all gibbering away, making up words and making up things. And someone else would say, well, you said this and you said that. And what it means is you're going to inherit money or you're going to have your sickness healed or, or something wonderful is going to happen. This man, true story, this man stood up and spoke in the Greek language. Now, this is down south. Nobody was knew Greek in the 70s, especially in a tent meeting full of Pentecostals. And he stood up and spoke in Greek. And some woman stood up and looked at this guy and said, you're saying uh, that, that many people will be saved or many things, good things are going to happen. He said, no, I wasn't. No, I didn't. I was speaking Greek, literal, the Greek language. You see, a lot of stuff is fake it's fake it's deception it's counterproductive but if you and 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 you all know this if you've been here more than three times you know I will preach against false teachings right and you think that's good okay just check it but I want to let you know on a sad note I could name a person that used to come here a few years back not too many years back just a few years back they stopped coming. You say, why? Because I preach against the falsehood. Not one, not two, not about three different families. Because I preach against the falsities of speaking in tongues and the heresy of false gifts. And they stop coming because that tendency, that leads to that I'm blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God. Do you understand? I'm blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God, preaching against false doctrine, and they stop coming. They like me. They like our church. They like all of you. But they stop coming because I preach against, watch it, sin. 
Speaking in tongues that is false is sin. That is a sin against the scripture. Ye do err not knowing the scriptures. Ye do err not knowing the scriptures. Ye do err not knowing the scriptures. Now, I know tongues happen in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. I know where it happened. I know what happened. It was 13 different distinct languages that were spoken in Acts chapter 2. It was also a gift to show to the Gentiles that the, uh, that to show that the Gentiles were accepted also as the Jews were accepted. It was supernatural languages, understandable languages. But people left here because goo goo gaga talk. I preach against childish foolishness. And that's blasphemy against the Holy Ghost and I'm lost forever. If you make fun of the gifts, these so-called quote on gifts. But you know what? This gift is like a cloud without rain, it says in Proverbs. Amen. So my goose is cooked forever if that's true. But I believe the Bible. I believe every single word of the Bible. I believe the whole Bible. And if somebody can teach me and show me, I will be glad to change it. We will become a tongue-talking church next week, or at least I will, uh, if you can show me from the Bible. But we can go through that another time, okay? And so the, the charismatic uh, six, apostolic successionists with gifts believe that you need to speak in tongues, etc., or you're not really full of the Holy Ghost. Now, the other side of the coin is the big umbrella that you and I fall under. We would, this is very huge, okay? This is super generic, evangelical. Let's talk for a minute. Let me do that really quick. What does that word evangelical imply? Just basic common. I'm not looking for theological academia stuff. What does it mean evangelical? If somebody says that guy's an evangelical, what does that mean? He spreads the gospel. What would be the action of an evangelical? He would go out and evangelize. The evangelical, how many understand we do evangelize? Praise God that we share the word of God. We tell people Jesus saves. We show people how Jesus can save and we lead them to the bloodstained cross so that Jesus will save them, hallelujah. We had four young people saved at, at, at Vacation Bible School. We don't have vacation Bible school, so our church kids who are already homeschooled and have Bible school every Thursday night all winter long can have another time in the summer. We have vacation Bible school so children don't die and go to hell. Thank you. Thank you. Who else is in here work Bible school? Raise your hand. All of you, raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. All the work you did, it's not in vain. Thank you for all the work you did, for the games, for the playing, for the singing, for the teaching. It all helps to bring people, young ones, to the cross because we believe children can be saved. We evangelize children. We evangelize the homeless. We evangelize the wealthy. We evangelize the poor. We evangelize the middle class. We evangelize. We believe in spreading the wonderful news. Jesus still saves. And that's a wonderful thing. So we don't focus on self-gratification of so-called quote-unquote tongues and signs and visions and wonders and things, which causes goose flesh. We evangelize the lost and tell them that Jesus is my safe. So we are evangelical. We tell people, if you're to die without the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot enter into his heaven. But here's the thing, our side, if you'll allow me, and I'm not trying to be divisive and controversial, okay? But what the evangelicals taught me and what I was taught in Bible school, what I was taught in seminary is that if somebody shares the gospel and you say no, and five years later, somebody shares the gospel, will you get saved? And they say no. And then they're on their deathbed at 75, 85, 90 years old, and they say, will you trust Christ? And that person says no, and they die and go into eternity, they said the rejection of Christ is the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Now that's logical, but that's not biblical. It is true if you reject Jesus Christ and you reject salvation and the Holy Ghost doesn't come in before you take your last breath, you are lost. But that, to my, my friends, stay with me now, that is not the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. So let's get back to doing what Victory Baptist Church does best. Let's look at what the Bible says about this subject. We're in Mark chapter 3. Let's have a word of prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your people. We thank you they came out on whew, hot night tonight, Lord, but it's great to be around your precious word. Thank you for the building. Thank you for the lights. Thank you for the air conditioning. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for living inside of us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for comforting us and strengthening us and guiding us into all truth. May we always be a people on a quest for truth, not superstition, not religious fairy tales, but a quest for for truth and we love you lord and i love these people and i pray you bless them and encourage them help us to hear now help me to help in jesus name amen we're gonna look at three passages tonight let's begin our reading in mark chapter 3 and verse number 22 mark chapter 3 and verse number 22 all right you know what i'm feeling motivated tonight would anyone like to read mark chapter 3 verses 22 to 30 Bev Finley, we're doing Bible study today. Bev Finley is going to read Mark chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. Remember, we're trying, before, let me qualify, Bev. We're trying to determine what God says is the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. A, is it making fun of speaking in tongues and healing in visions? B, is it rejecting Christ and going into eternity lost? Or is it C, something else? All right, Bev, when you're ready, 22 to 30, please. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. And he called them unto him, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? Mm. And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but he hath an end. Amen. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. All right, the answer's right in front of you, but before we do, let me give you some uh, details. Thank you, Bev, for that reading. I appreciate that so much. All right, number one, it says that uh, what the scribes, uh, these uh, uh, hypocrites, these religious self-righteous scribes, in the city of Jerusalem, Jesus was healing and teaching. And look what it says in verse 22. He, meaning Jesus, in verse 22, hath Beelzebub, Beelzebub, and the prince of the devils. What I want you to see there is prince of the devils. That means there are many devils. Do you understand? There's not just one big fat devil and little demons. There are many devils according to the Bible. The Bible says that the scribes said that Jesus hath Beelzebub in him. All right, Beelzebub is another name for who? Say it out loud, everyone. Well, let's say that together. What's Beelzebub is synonymous with? Satan himself. Okay, the, the definition of the word Beelzebub, it comes from Baal and the Canaanite worship of God. He is the ultimate one. Beelzebub is also, some of you will recognize this phrase, is defined this way. Beelzebub is the Lord of the flies. How many have ever heard that phrase before? Lord of the flies. Beelzebub, Satan, is the Lord of the flies. Now, of course, there was that famous novel written in, the, I believe it was the 1940s or so. How, who wrote The Lord of the Flies, the book? Anybody? How many know the book I'm talking about? About these children uh, shipwrecked on this island and, and they wind up this, this killer be killed society of these handful of shipwrecked children. It's called Lord of the Flies. Now, why does, why does, uh, why does God call him Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies? Uh, part of it is because what are flies? Now, uh, some of you already know this. What is it that flies are always attracted to? They're attracted to two things. Death is one. Who said it? Death, they always find a dead corpse. You ever see a roadkill? They're always covered in flies. You ever see uh, uh, animals? They're, flies always swarm on dead things. Death. Beelzebub is the lord of the flies. Where are flies? They're always around death. What's the second one? Fecal matter. Fecal matter. Waste. Waste. Animal waste, human waste, etc. Flies always culminate and accumulate
on waste and death because the devil is the king of waste and the devil, stay with me now, look up here please, the devil is the king of waste and the king of death. That's what he does. He wastes your life and then he kills you and sends you to hell forever. Well, if you allow me. And so the Lord of the flies. Okay, so these scribes are telling Jesus, you have the power of the devil upon you. And by the princes of the devils casteth he out devils. And so they're saying you're evil and you're wicked and you're bad and you're empowered by Satan. But look what Jesus said. If a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. So in other words, if Jesus is saying, if I'm filled with the devil and I'm casting out devils, we're a divided kingdom. It cannot stand. Hey, by the way, I think there's a really good lesson for you to learn right there. If your household is a divided house, it will crumble. And the deeper the division, the sooner the split. Now, that doesn't mean divorce court necessarily. But you don't want your home and your family and your house and your life divided. You need to be on the same page. How can two walk together except they be agreed? You need to be in sync with each other spiritually. You need to be in sync with your spouse. You need to be in sync with the Lord. You need to not be a house of division. You cannot bite and devour one another, as it says in Corinthians, and expect to live. By the way, we need to be a church that's all united in one body. Amen? Listen now, this is where it gets practical. You can't and I don't say this, please, in God's name. This is not about me. One more time. This is not about me right here, what I'm about to say. You cannot sit and listen to the sermons and then go home and trash talk me as the preacher and expect your home not to be eventually divided. It doesn't work that way. And let me tell you a story just on a side note. Many years ago, I was a brand new Christian again. I was sitting in a, I went to a Baptist church and it was wonderful. Anyone remember Mike Edwards, Pastor Edwards? He came up, preached at men's meeting. If you guys were here, he preached the Sundays and all that, okay? The men's meeting, okay? And he, it was wonderful. Um, he preached and boy, he did a great job. But you know what? When I was 19 years old, I was in, in the Marines and I was at his church and this family, this this, this deacon asked me to come over and have dinner with another young single guy and come to his house with all of his kids and his wife. And we're sitting there, uh, please bless the food and pass the gravy in Jesus' name, amen. And we were pouring gravy and eating pot roast and having all the good time and all that stuff. And boy, oh boy, if they, well, he certainly was long today, wasn't he? Boy, everybody got it right in the eyes, didn't they? Man, I don't know why he has to go on about that subject. And I'm looking at his teenage kids, and I mean it, as a brand new Christian of only two years being saved, I literally, I was waiting for the lightning to come through the roof and kill those people. They were trash talking the man of God. I'm thinking, why do they go to church if this is what they come home and do? Hey, folks, it doesn't work that way. And then they wonder why their kids are out of church and out of God's will and hating on them and hating on God and nothing to do with Jesus. You can't do that. You must be in unite, united as a family, spiritually united with the church also. You got to be on board. And it ain't about me. It's about whoever is leading at that time. You need to be on board. And if you have a problem, you know, we all know how that works, Matthew 18. But I, 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 I digress, all right? So you want to be careful that you're not, you know, attacking the spiritual leadership because you will hurt your home and your family in the end. And so Beelzebub is the God, God of, uh, Lord of the flies. But then they said that Jesus was full of Beelzebub and he spoke blasphemy 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 what does it mean to be blasphemy to speak irreverently about god or sacred matters like the bible and make fun of by do you know to deny the bible as far as i'm concerned that is blasphemy you don't believe this is the living breathing word of god that is eternally from eternity past eternity future that's blasphemy be careful be careful so you don't want to be blast uh, uh, you don't want to practice blasphemy and they said that Jesus was filled with blasphemy. So what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Don't tell us, this is important as a Bible-believing Christian, don't tell people what you, well, I think. 
Don't tell people, well, I feel. Tell me what the Bible says. Tell me what the Bible says. Don't tell me what you think. Don't tell me what you feel. Well, you, Pastor Pooh, you don't understand. My great aunt Hagatha out in Saskatchewan loves the Lord more than you do. And she speaks in tongues every morning for breakfast. And she's a much better Christian than you'll ever be. And I'm sure she is, but she's wrong in that area. Amen? Can we just be real here? Getting quiet on me now. Can I say this kindly? Sometimes it's still true. Truth hurts. I don't say that smartly, and I don't say that looking for a fight, and I don't say that to be a troublemaker. I'm just saying, I want to know what the Bible says, not what Aunt Hagatha practices. All right? And so uh, they said that Jesus was a blasphemer. And let's pick it up. Let's look at what the verses that Bev read there. She read all the way down about division. And he talks about no man can enter into a strong man house. So Jesus, they deal with the division. He explains what they're saying is wrong. And in verse 27, he starts to give them a visual aid, a picture. Picture a strong man in his house. Nobody's going to mess with this guy. And you want to spoil his goods, wreck the house and tear it and toss it and turn it upside down. Ex in verse 27, except he will first bind the strong man. You've got to tie him up, tie his feet together, tie his hands together. In verse 27, and then he will spoil his house. Then you can do what you want. Verse 28, verily I say unto you, all sins, all sins, all sins, all means all, shall be forgiven unto the sons of men. And blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. You can be forgiven of blasphemies. That's what Jesus is teaching. This is red letter right here. That means Jesus is speaking, verse 29. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. So what is the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost? Look at the colon there at the end of verse 29. The answer and the continuation. Verse 30, because they the Sadducees said, he, the blessed Jesus Christ, hath an unclean spirit. Hath an unclean spirit. All blasphemies against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said, hath an unclean spirit. All right, let's look at another one. Can I get someone else to read scripture? I need someone to read Luke 11, 14 to 23. Luke chapter 11, Buford will do that if you get a mic here. Let's all turn in our, our Holy Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Are we okay tonight? Look up here. Is this okay? Kids, look up here. Are we okay? Are we okay, Julia? Are we okay? Colt, are we okay? Are we okay? You sure? You following? You getting this? You tracking? Haley, you tracking? Okay, just want to make sure the kids know too. Luke 11, 14 to 23, when you're ready. And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb, and it came to pass... When the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub, and if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I, with the finger of God, cast Amen. out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherewith he trusted and divideth his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. Uh, keep reading. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Okay, that's all right. You know what? This is, I wrote down the wrong reference somewhere for this. But, uh, what I want you to see is that it's still it's it's still the basically the same lineup here where you have uh, they accuse Jesus of being full of the devil they accuse Jesus of being filled with Beelzebub they, they then he analogizes the strong man uh, I need to find that other reference but I can't do it right now what is it 
12, 10. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 12, verse 10. I just typed down the wrong thing, okay? Luke chapter 12 and verse number 10, okay? But he, uh, we'll pick it up at nine, but he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word, <laughs> excuse me, a word against the son of man, it shall be forgiven him. Okay, say his name. Everybody, who is the son of man? Jesus. One more time, who is the son of man? Jesus. Jesus is the son of man. If you speak against him like Peter spoke against him at the fire that night, it will be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates of the power, take ye no thought of what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. Okay, so there's no forgiveness in verse 10 of the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. It cannot be forgiven him. Okay, and I'm going to go back to Mark in just a minute, but let's go to Matthew, Matthew 22 to 32. This will be the last one we'll look at besides the revisiting the first one. Matthew uh, 12, 22 to 32. All right, can I get someone else to read? Someone else to read Matthew 12, 22 to 32. Haley will read Matthew 12, 22 to 32. All right, whenever you're ready, Haley. And Jesus answered and spake unto Matthew 12, 22. Oh, sorry. Then was brought. And then, then was brought unto him one possession with the devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him in so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and and said, this, this not, is not this the son of the David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. The prince of the devils. Mm -hmm. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divideth again itself is brought, is brought to desolation and every, and every city or house divided again itself shall not stand. If Sa and if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall, how, sh how shall then his kingdom stand? If I by Beelzebub mm -hmm. cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into, strong, into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except be first blind the strong man, and then he will, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me is scattered abroad. Wherefore I say unto him, All manner of sin and bl and blasphemy shall not shall not shall, shall be. be forgiven unto men. Uh, but the blaspheme against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither is his world, neither in the world to come. All right. Thank you, Haley, for that. You did a great job, by the way. She does very well reading. By the way, don't ever be afraid to teach your children to read the Holy Bible. They'll become much smarter, much wiser. Yep, if the kids need to go, but Mr. Sam and uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Finley go, now is the time to go to prayer pal time. We're going to finish up our lesson, okay? So we have three accounts of the same story. It's very basic. They say Jesus has a devil. They say that he casts out devils by Beelzebub, the Lord of the flies. And then Jesus explains to them, clearly, clearly you're wrong. Because a house divided against itself, if the devil's casting out the devil... The devil is divided and you everybody knows the battle strategy for ages divide and 
conquer. So if you, if, he, if you cast out devils by the devil, you're dividing your own house, you're conquering your own house. So then he says, let me tell you a story about a strong man with his own house. If you want to rob him, you better tie him up hand and feet. Then you break his house. Then you take his stuff. Then you do what you want. So it can't be implied that Jesus has a devil. And then he explains to him that. And let's go back to Mark 3. Mark 3, 22, Mark chapter 3. This is the last time we're going to turn tonight. Mark chapter 3 and verse number 22. Mark chapter 3 and verse 22. We looked at the parallel passages, and I want you to drop down with me in verse 29 and 30, and I want to reread those two and apply the answer to the question. You can curse Jesus. You can blaspheme Jesus. Peter did at the fire that night, and he was forgiven. You can do a lot of blasphemies. You can curse the word of God, throw the word of God, deny the word of God, and be forgiven. But he says clearly in 20, you cannot be forgiven of blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. So the question is back to the beginning, and then we'll answer in just a moment by demonstration. A, is the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost making fun of false gifts that are from the Holy Ghost, but they're not really from the Holy Ghost? B, is it saying, no, Jesus, I won't get saved. No, Jesus, I won't get saved. No, Holy Spirit, do not come in me, and you die without Christ, and you deny the Holy Spirit, and you deny Jesus, and go into hell? Evangelicals would teach, I was taught that in seminary. Or is it something else? The answer is found in verse 30. If you just study the Bible, if the seminary professors would just study the Bible, the answers are in black and white, sometimes red and white, but they're there. Look at verse 30. Because they, the Sadducees, said, he, the Lord Jesus, hath an unclean spirit. Now, if you're going to do that, this has to come into place. All right, Buford, stand here. Uh, Brian, why don't you come help me? All right, just need you to stand here, all right? Okay, Scott, come on. We need young and old and everything. No, no props. We're good. We're all good. No, this side, this side. This side, this side. Everyone's this side. Okay. Forgive me, but he represents the Lord Jesus. Forgive me. <laughs> okay? We are the Sadducees. We're religious. We're self-righteous. We're hypocrites. We're know-it-alls. And he heals the man who needs healing. He heals him. We look at him. He heals through the power of Satan. He is the tool of Satan. Yes, yes. He is the tool of Satan. He rebuts us and tells us, no, 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 no. That's a house divided. And then he explains by illustration with story. No, nah, you got to bind the strong man before you can take over his house. And so if we say he hath a devil inside of him, okay, they're saying clean demonic spirit lives in the blessed lord jesus christ let me ask you a question what spirit now this is a no-brainer here what spirit do you believe lives inside of the lord jesus christ two thousand years ago perfect one more time the okay so if we the sadducees look at he the blessed lord jesus christ and say you're not full of a clean spirit you're full of the devil spirit, an unholy spirit Reread verse 30 to yourself. Look at it right there. Because they said, he hath a devil. Now look up here. You believe the Bible? Say amen. If it's in black and white, say amen. That is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now watch it. Now this is where you're not thinking it all the way through. Some of you anyway. Okay. If you're going to say to Jesus, Jesus has to be standing on the earth incarnate in the flesh to be able to look at him and say you are full of an unclean spirit when he's completely full of the holy spirit that is how you blaspheme the holy spirit there's only one other time he'll be on earth that you could look at him and do that and it's not when he was a man two thousand years ago when's the next time jesus will be on earth second coming millennium during the millennial reign, they'll be able to look at him again and say, that guy sitting on that throne, that son of David, he's full of the devil. Those are the only two times you can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You say, why? Because that's why we have eternal security. Come on now, once saved, you can't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. 
you cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit if we have eternal security. It has to happen with Jesus on earth in the form of a man because they said he hath an unclean spirit. Because he will be here on a throne, he hath an unclean spirit. Then they'll throw him straight into hell physically. So that is what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. And you know what people say? Now listen to me. This is really important because this is going on all the time. Somebody who loves God gets saved and they get wrapped up in and I hate to use it, but the kids are pretty much gone, okay? They say, people who get saved, and then they go off into deep sexual immorality. Oh, he blasphemed the Holy Spirit. He's definitely not saved. He can't be saved. He's immoral. He can't be saved. He's an adulterer. She can't be saved. She's a perpetual fornicator. And I blasphemed the Holy Ghost. No, you've sinned against your flesh. You've sinned against your Savior. You've sinned against God. There are consequences to that. Yes. You may get, it, please excuse me, I understand, but all the kids are gone. You may get communicable diseases that will kill you and put you in the hospital. You'll destroy your marriage. You'll destroy your parents. You'll break their heart. You'll do a lot of damage. But please don't confuse immorality, and that's always the choice of sin when it comes to blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Not if you study the Bible. Not if you read the Bible. You cannot in the church age proper, in the state of grace that you and I are in, blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And I will stand adamantly on that. And I did not always preach that, nor did I always believe that, until I started really reading the Bible and stopped reading stupid commentaries and theologians and start studying the Bible. It makes all the difference in the universe. Okay, you blasphemers, sit down. And yes, Buford, you are a blasphemer too. These guys are, you can sit down, blasphemer. Get down, sit down, blasphemers. <laughs> all right, okay. Okay, all right. I know that was a kind of an intense one, but I don't know. I just felt impressed. That, I don't know why, but I just felt impressed that I needed to do that tonight. So does anyone have a question about this subject? And you can challenge anything. Don't be inhibited. Don't be intimidated. The only bad question is the one you never asked. And I might be honest and say, I don't know. And you have to accept that. I don't have all the answers. If I did, I'd be God. Yes. Turn on the... Holy Spirit. Blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Is eternal damnation absolutely okay if i have the holy spirit living in me sure can you blaspheme me thereby blaspheming the holy spirit i no, because it says you have to they said he and the he word for word he is the lord jesus christ okay. it wasn't generic it was a specific okay he the lord so i would say absolutely not okay okay i Good. don't know if that and by the way you don't have to take my word for it yeah. But I am confident of that one, so yes. I'm pretty lazy, so I'll just take your word. <laughs> oh, <for it>. don't. <laughs> yes. Anthony. It should that, be on. It'll come on. That was my same, same question. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I don't know if I'm quite as lazy. I'm still lazy. I'm tired today. But um, just because it's, it refers to the Holy Spirit, and yes, I see like it was Jesus, and, and I, I understand that. Um, but it, but it is referring to the Holy Spirit in Jesus. And so as the Holy Spirit is in us in, a, in, a, in the same way, right, then I'm just wondering how that, even though it, it does contradict that well, once saved, always saved. Okay, too, so. mm, okay. I understand <laughs> you and Brian are basically kind of saying the same, but I would submit that the Bible, the precedence I set is Every word of the Bible is accurate and, and binding for eternity. When it, they said the definition, the colon, the continuation of the thought is you have to say he hath a devil. To look at Jesus Christ and say he hath a devil is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So Anthony, I would also build on that Christians can have devils in them. Now, I don't, I'm not getting into this tonight. I'm not getting into That's a whole nother two-hour subject. But Christians can have demons upon them. Christians have demons in them. They can infect them around them, but not Jesus Christ. He was pure, 100% pure. If, you don't, if you're saved and you've never been influenced by a demon, you're clueless. You're clueless, right? Go ahead, ask the hard question. And no, I'm not teaching a lesson on it, but go ahead. Okay, so I just have to ask a question about Fire away. what you just said. So I've always been taught, right or wrong. Yep. Um, that, like, God and sin cannot dwell together. 
God and sin cannot dwell together. But devils are sin, so how can the Holy Spirit inside of me dwell with an unclean spirit inside of me? Okay, unclean spirits. I said I'm not going to teach a lesson on that, but I will give you the 10-second dealing. If you don't think demon oppression and demon uh, uh, possession are real, you're not, in very, you're not very spiritually awake. Demon oppression. If you don't think Christians can be demon oppressed and they're working you over. Okay, short answer is your spirit can never be demon possessed, ever. Your spirit, your soul can be bothered and, and attacked by demons, not your spirit. Your spirit cannot sin. Your spirit is quickened and made alive. That's in 1 John. And so the spirit is that, is, uh, is, is, is that which is regenerated and that which cannot be demon possessed, period. Ever, never, ever. That's how eternal security comes into play. Uh, but if you don't think devils are all around you all the time, working in you and bothering you, yeah, okay, they are. Yes, quickly, we have a microphone. I knew this was going to open a can of worms, but okay. Well, the more you yield to your flesh, too, that gives devils the opportunity to, to get to the, your fleshly part. They can still get to that. They can't yes. get to your tripart of you that's now saved and sealed by the Holy Ghost, but yes. everything else they can get to. Right, so they can work over your flesh. Yeah. The devils and demons can't. They just can't get to your spirit. You're a trichotomy of body, a soul, and a spirit, not body and soul, not body and soul, uh, body and spirit. You're a body and soul and spirit. You're in the shadow of Christ, Father, uh, shadow of God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. You're a triune shadow of God, which is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, okay? So the point is simply, is simply that Christ cannot be indwelled by demons, period. But Christians can be badgered, and some would say that you can attack the flesh, oppress the flesh, demons. How many have been saved and you've been attacked by demons? That's a lot. Okay, they're working you over. So the point I'm trying to express to answer her question, which I said I'm not getting into tonight, we'll have to do a whole other lesson some other time on that, is that... Um, to look at Jesus and say he hath a devil. That's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Yes. Here and then someone else there. All right, back can, there, then up here. Okay. Can I just add one more thing quickly? Yes. Um, Hurry. As a born-again child of God yes. and sealed by the Holy Ghost, yes. if somebody were to say something against you, though you have the Holy Ghost in you, you can't perform the works that Jesus did and his miracles. It's attributing the works that Jesus was doing to an unclean spirit. Well said. He's saying the supernatural gifts and powers that Christ had were attributed to Satan. I cannot raise the dead. I cannot open the eyes of the blind, but Jesus could. And to say that he was doing that by the devil is blasphemy, the Holy Spirit. Well said. Uh, to, to say that we were tempted by the Holy Ghost, I, I, I mean, our sin nature makes us want to sin. Sometimes we'd like to blame that on Satan. There are times, for sure, when I've, I know that I am under attack and and sometimes I'd like to take the blame for being under attack allowing myself to get into a situation that would right. put me doing things that I know the Bible says I'm not supposed to do and I'm doing them can I blame that on Satan or just stupid me sometimes it's my own stinking you know, rotten um, and my flesh dwelleth no good thing yeah so I <clears throat> I didn't put up my hand That's okay. when you said you know, oh. have we been attacked? Um, <coughs> I'm going to say I got more attacked when I rededicated my life. Right. Uh, then good things fell on my lap that shouldn't be there, that I had to say no to. Right. The test was on. Those were tests Amen. from Satan, not from God. Right. So. All right. Excellent. Who was back there? There was a couple others, Jerry, then Candace. Anyone over here? Anyone over here? To, to, uh, to put it simply uh, further to what Buford said, when one yields to the flesh, it's a sign that they are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. Not right? indwelt by, but completely enveloped and full of the Holy Spirit. They're so not. if someone's filled with the Holy Spirit, that's going to push out the possibility that any, un, like, you know, um, that they would be to play off the analogy, uh, indwelled by a, a devil or the, you know, okay. that sort of thing. Okay. So. Yep. No. That's about it. It's good. That's excellent. All right. Some folks will argue back and forth about 
uh, demonic oppression or devil possession and things like that. I don't think you're a heretic either way on that thing, but your spirit can never be demon possessed because it's born of the spirit of God. Your flesh, as he said, that's another story. In my flesh, Paul said, writing under the guise of the Holy Spirit, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, and that is not false humility. He was saying, my flesh is rotten. All right, who else had their hand up? I know there was one or two. Candace, yes. You just covered it, so we're good. <laughs> so, no, go ahead, reiterate. No, it's good to hear another voice say the same thing. Don't worry about it. I was more just curious the difference between oppression and possession. Yes. I realize that, you know, a Christian can be oppressed, but I wasn't sure, like, but you were talking more like a Christian's flesh could be possessed, but not their spirit. Not their spirit. Absolutely okay. not. Okay. okay. And remember, you can't, you can't just agree with me. You have to know what you believe. I believed in the other one uh, there for a long time. But, you know, you start studying the Bible, it'll ruin a theological degree. But uh, that's okay. I'd rather be right with the Lord and right with what the Word says than to worry about what the professor says of academia and what they say on the Trinity Broadcast Network. I'm not getting my theology there either. Yes. <clears throat> Um, just because you didn't explicitly state it, but but you believe, um, or yeah, like the belief that that as they call them, the charismatic gifts have ceased, is what you are stating, right? That they have ceased. Absolutely. Okay. And I have taught hours and hours on that one. That that <clears throat> yes. And so then you had said that, or from my understanding, you you said that like um, that we can't do what Jesus did. Absolutely. I know you're going to say greater works will we do, right? Or no? Well, yeah, like, like there is that I, there's a thought, so I'm just wondering, wondering your, your yeah, that, that like the Holy Spirit will, I guess, is my understanding is like that, that, that we are, that we'll be able to do greater things. And it's, it sounds pretty general. I, 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 don't, I forget the, the scripture. Uh, I'd, I'd have to go it's back. It's John. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. John 14 mm -hmm. what? 14, 12. But anyway, go ahead. So your question specifically is what? Um, mm -mm. I, I just wanted to confirm. That do, I, do, we, do I hold that the Bible teaches that uh, the supernatural apostolic sign gifts are gone? Yes. Absolutely, yes. I believe it's scriptural. Um, they are ceased because we have the completed revelation of God in our hand. And we do not need those because we have this. The only reason the gifts were in play, and I'm not teaching on this tonight either, but the only reason the gifts were in play was to give credit to the preaching that they made that day. So they preach Jesus saves, and then they do miracles. Whoa, this is for real. This is true. They just did miracles. So obviously this Jesus story is true. I need to get saved. As where we have from Genesis to Revelation in our hand, we don't need those gifts. Anyone want to comment on that part right there? I'd like some help here. One and two right there. We got a room, Anthony, we got a room full of preachers in here. I don't, I don't even need to do this. We got people that know this stuff. Yes. The greater works that you shall do yes. is in reference to the disciples that were sent out to confirm to the Jews that Jesus really was the Son of God. Contextually, you're saying that the greater works was specifically directed at the the 12 apostle disciples, not at us today. Yeah, uh, yes, and those others that were in the upper room with them. To Excellent. Con to confirm the ministry of Jesus. Yeah. All to right, the, very to good. The Jewish. There you go, buddy. All right, Bridget. It was also the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament, which give the validity of the word of God, and therefore we don't need all the sort of the miracles. Okay, it's, so you're saying Old Testament prophecy? fulfilled in the New Testament. We don't need the supernatural signs because we have prophecy fulfilled, prophecy right. fulfilled, well said. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophecies have been fulfilled and yet there are still more to come. Hallelujah. Well said, well said, excellent thoughts, yes. Uh, just, uh, who, was who was asking about the oppression and? Uh, Anthony and, and Denise brought it up. Okay, if I can just give you a picture of it, okay? This is oppression. Right. This is possession, they're different, right? Okay. Right. Absolutely. Con complete control or kind of like steering along. Okay. All right. Let's see. All right. Any more questions or comments? I like it. I like it. I don't like it when everyone just sits there like last week and just goes, any questions? No. I like it. Go ahead. Don't need what was prof you know what what was predicted in John fourteen twelve. Also, because 
were not Jews. The Jews require a sign. Absolutely. Well said, Jerry. The Bible says the Jew require a sign, tongues, healing, visions, interpretations. Jews require a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom. We need information. We need to know what God said. Excellent. Good point, Jerry. I can't believe I missed that one. Well done. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Possession, oppression. Jessica, stand up here. Okay. Okay. She's here. She's lost in the world in sin. All of a sudden, she chooses. This is my daughter, by the way. She turns around. She gets saved. She has done a repentance. She has turned towards Christ, towards the cross, away from the world. Okay. She's a baby Christian. Uh, she doesn't grow, so the devil leaves her alone. But as she's pressing on the upward way right there, new heights she's gaining every day, all of a sudden the devil starts saying, hey, wait a minute, she's living for God. We need to start oppressing her and keeping her from getting where the victorious Christian life is and keep bothering her. You see, if you don't live for God, the devil leaves you alone. Say amen to that. He'll let you have your way. He'll let you have your fun and wildness for a season. But once you, once you start living for God, they're going to start hanging around you, all right? So they're going to start oppressing you, trying to stop you. And then it can, if, uh, if you start, go back down. But then she gets tired of all the oppression in the world. She goes backwards. She backslides. And, you know, she may get totally oppressed. Or, absolutely, you know, she may get that way, and then it'll come off. And the closer you get to God, the more the devil's going to start bothering you. Why do you think God hates this church? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How many learned something the last six years that you didn't know before? Okay, that's ten of you. What about the rest of you? <laughs> Holy guacamole, Batman. Wow. Okay. So, you know, you need to know the Bible. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Fill with the Spirit. There's a difference between being dwelt by... Go ahead and sit down, sweetie. Being dwelt by the Spirit and completely enveloped and full of the Spirit. All right, excellent. Great stuff. Thank you for your interaction tonight. Any more questions, comments, or challenges? We are super late, but we need to go offline.